the recording has started and we can uh, continue we were at uh, acts chapter 11 and verse 24 we saw how the bigger church or the more uh, we we could we can say not that the bigger church is perfect but whatever they had whatever god had poured out on them the church of jerusalem was willing to share and impart it to the smaller churches um, and these smaller churches uh, at least in the the context that we are uh, you know studying about them these churches were you could say planted by accidental missionaries they did not intend to go to certain regions but it happened because of persecution and here they were uh, you know just living out their christian life and speaking the the truth of the word to people and People gave their lives to Christ and churches were, were established. And so beautiful to know that wherever God's people went, there were churches because sharing the gospel was just part of their, uh, their uh, you know, lifestyle. So verse 25, uh, we continue to read about Barnabas. Barnabas was there encouraging this church uh, in Syrian Antioch. In verse 25, then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. So very interesting. If you recall earlier, you know, Saul, as soon as he became a believer, he was passionate to preach about Christ in the synagogues. He wasn't accepted. And we also saw how he went to, uh, uh, you know, the, the church of Jerusalem. He went to the apostles. Even the apostles were afraid to accept Saul because they thought that this could be a trick, you know, that uh, uh, a persecutor is acting like a believer and who knows? down the road they might end up in trouble if they entertained uh, this individual called as Saul but thank God for Barnabas you know Barnabas was a man who could see the good in Saul okay uh, and obviously it wasn't a foolish decision on the part of Barnabas he was quite aware of what he was doing and he understood that Saul was not an imposter but that he was a genuine believer in the Lord. And though he was a new believer, Barnabas trusted in what God could do through Saul's life. And Barnabas is an example of a person who believes, uh, you know, a believer who believes uh, in, the, in, in the purpose and destiny of another believer, okay, and encourages them. So, uh, but for Barnabas, you wouldn't have uh, uh, Saul emerge and you know come to the the places where where uh, he could do his ministry and be accepted. You know uh, uh, later on that we'll see. Uh, but while people rejected Saul, there was a Barnabas who accepted. So it's beautiful to see how God uses the personality of every individual in this case barnabas very accommodating person a uh, very nurturing fatherly uh, kind of a person and god worked through that and uh, barnabas when he saw the church of antioch you look at the passion he had firstly he was sent by the apostles then um, he encouraged the church of antioch and he noticed wow god's grace is upon these people so we must ensure that they go to the next level so somewhere in his heart he would have thought how about you know we we bring in men and women of god who can impart more who can invest more in the lives of uh, uh, you know these these young believers and so he immediately thought of saul and it says verse 25 says he made an effort it wasn't easy so he departed to Tar tarsus where he knew saul was to seek saul it says so he searched he literally searched for saul because he needed a co-worker so Barnabas also seems to be the kind, you know, who everyone has their own lead uh, type or style of leadership. So he's more like a team worker. He likes people. Uh, he likes to include people in, in his assignment. So he seeks out Saul to bring him to the church of Antioch, verse 26. And when he had 
found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So you see here what's happening. You know, it's something like how uh, we envision here at APC. Oh, one short term Bible college, three months, let's do that. Or, you know, Bible college, one year, let's equip the people. So they felt Barnabas and Saul, they had this, this burden that we must equip the people. These are wonderful believers, but they need to become stronger in the word of God. So how about you know, we, we uh, you know, uh, deliver the word and share with the people what the word has to say about you know, maybe the foundations of the faith and then other things, um, the gifts of the spirit, so many different things that the people really needed to learn. So one year. So what did they teach the church of Antioch in one year? Uh, probably whatever they knew because remember earlier we saw that the once people started believing in jerusalem uh, apostles were going house to house they were teaching what they were teaching the doctrine whatever was handed to them the same doctrine they were teaching and whatever jesus taught them so they were just passing on what they knew and similarly we can expect that barnabas and saul passed on whatever they knew to this church in antioch so one year of strengthening people in the word you know later to the uh, Ephesian church, we will see that Paul says in Acts 20, verse 32, he will say that you know, building, uh, you know, the, the word of God is able to build you up. So why are they preaching? Why are they teaching the people the word of God for one year? You know, the word has an ability to strengthen, to establish people in, in God, in the kingdom of God. So that's very important, right? So they knew that if they can invest this one year and equip God's people in the world, the church of Antioch will become a strong church. So in verse 26, the end of that uh, verse, so beautiful. You know, the people of Antioch or the members of this church of Antioch, they, Luke says, the disciples, believer, now disciple, okay, they are followers of Jesus now because they are equipped in the word and they have committed to that word. So they are followers or they are disciples and you know, they became noticeable disciples. So they were called Christians or Christians is like little Christ, you know. Uh, they represent Jesus Christ. So for the first time, the followers of Jesus were known as Christians. Uh, so far, we've not seen this word in the Bible. Here is the first time uh, in Acts 11 that this term Christians has even uh, emerged. Earlier, the people who were following Jesus, what were they known as? The people of the way. Okay, so that was the term which was used for believers. But now, as believers are becoming you know, more like Jesus, they are disciples, their lifestyle is, is uh, revealing Christ, they were called as Christians in Antioch. So this is where the term Christians is found for the first time in the book of Acts. Okay, so now we have these equipped Christians in the church of Antioch. What else is happening in Antioch? Okay, uh, verse 27. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. So you see there, the relationship between churches, so beautiful. Earlier, there was encouragement. Earlier, there was, uh, you know, Barnabas came to do a small spiritual survey and, and check out hey what do these people really need and he figured they need to be equipped with the word so he went he quickly brought Saul and said okay come on let's do this together Saul we'll be a team let's teach the word to these people so they equip the church in the word of God and now what else does this church of uh, Antioch need they figured they need the ministry of the spirit so in verse 27 we are told prophets came from jerusalem so the fivefold ministry so far teachers were there and now prophets are coming in 
so what is happening they are trying to establish they are trying to make the church grow well okay so this is how a small church can grow well when there is input there is investment a spiritual investment in their life so prophets have come verse 28 then one of them named agabus stood up and showed by the spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world which also happened in the days of claudius caesar Verse 29, then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So prophets come to minister. So there is ministry of the word. There is ministry of the spirit. So you see, both of these are required in the local church, ministry of the word. And I'm just using the word ministry of the spirit to kind of, you know, uh, uh, talk about this umbrella term of the gifts of the spirit and, uh, you know, the, the presence of God, the glory of God, all that coming into the, the church. So the word and the spirit, with that, the church of Antioch, you know, the, uh, the elders thought that the church must be established in this way. So, when the prophets came, there was a prophet. Uh, obviously, he's a notable and a well-respected prophet. So you see here how Agabus had established himself. How could people trust him for the prophecy that he released? He said that uh, you know the, the spirit is revealing to me that there is going to be a great famine throughout the world, throughout all the world. Okay, Something that happened at the time of Claudius Caesar. So when Agabus said this, people took action. So this tells us that he was a trusted prophet. Unless, you know, his words could be trusted, people will not take action. So obviously, he was a notable, uh, experienced, trusted prophet. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they knew that what he was saying, Maybe even you know, they would have had their own internal checks and come to the conclusion that, yes, what he is saying is from the Spirit of God. So they begin to act on it. Okay. Now, in understanding the prophetic, we have learned this. We have said that whenever there is a prophetic word, we must check. We must, uh, you know, uh, confirm that it is really from God and then we act on it. So in this case, though it's happening in two verses, our understanding is there must have been that internal check and the people were sure that, yes, what he's saying is correct. So what do they do? They, according to their ability, according to each person's ability, they determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. So the famine, you know, there, there, there was a great, there was going to be a great famine, but these people have already acted in faith you know for the famine to come there was no compulsion again remember even in the early church we saw how people just brought their gifts and laid it at the feet of the apostles by their own will so even here according to each person's own ability so maybe some people gave more some people gave less but there was no pressure as far as giving was concerned they gave whatever they uh, and the idea was to collect some fund as a relief for the brethren dwelling in Judea. Okay, so when the famine comes, this money will be helpful. And how do they send it? You see how they are doing everything with great wisdom. You know, when money is uh, handled poorly, uh, you know, it really messes things up, especially in, in the Christian circle. Uh, but the church of Antioch seems to be a wise church and uh, no wonder because, you know, they, ha they have the leadership of godly uh, men and women. So when the money was collected, maybe you know, they had a discussion and everything about how to send this money. They did it in an honorable way. So they sent it through trustworthy people and not one person, two people so that there is transparency. So they hand it they send it to the elders so it's quite clear the money should be taken to the elders of the church of jerusalem through the hands of barnabas and saul 
okay so that there is accountability what happened uh, you know how did, did the money reach the elders uh, you know there is a confirmation right so they did things in a very wise way so that's what we've seen so this is a little bit about the church of antioch so how are you all doing i hope uh, it's going okay so far are you with me okay good yeah good to good to hear back from all of you thank you so much let's continue we are at chapter 12 now so we have learned a little bit about um, you know the uh, church of antioch and the persecution days but god is still doing mighty things um, through his church our verse uh, chapter 12 we read somehow luke brings the focus back to persecution the focus was persecution in uh, acts uh, uh, 9 when when we saw that uh, saul he took you know he he took the um, permission to go uh, to damascus and uh, you know there he he wanted to to uh, bring back believers as prisoners so there was intense persecution that was already um, happening but all the more in chapter 12 so we are starting at uh, the first verse of Acts chapter 12. It says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Was it new that Herod was, uh, you know, trying to persecute the believers? Not at all new. It was already happening. But this is a more direct kind of a persecution because it is coming from the ruler, Herod the king and his efforts to persecute some from the church who is this herod okay who is this herod so this herod is herod agrippa one he is the grandson of herod the great who ruled during the birth of jesus okay, you all will recall the the small children were being killed the the <coughs> excuse me the boys, uh, you know, small boys were being killed uh, because of of the uh, decree of Herod the Great. Now, this Herod in Acts 12 is the grandson and he is Herod Agrippa I. Um, so you, you notice here that, you know, it seems like they continue to have um, this, this sense of anger for... The things of god and you know jesus and his followers uh and during the trial of jesus there is another herod uh, who is the nephew okay who, who is the um okay forget it so let's let's not go into that uh history part of it we'll just stick to this so herod agrippa one Okay, so we all know that uh, he was the grandson of uh, Herod the Great and he continued you know, with uh, the activities of persecution. So what exactly happened? So we see here, verse 2, it says, Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So in one sentence, Luke states that the persecution in the church went to you know, the, the greatest heights, great levels. So far, believers were being persecuted, you know, un unknown people and maybe um, some volunteers like Stephen in the church. But still now we have not seen a leader of the church persecuted. But in one sentence, Luke says, Herod, he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So that is to say that James was beheaded. Who is this James? You know, James is the son of Zebedee. Usually you see uh, James and John. And you also see how, um, you know, Peter, James and John, you know, they went with Jesus. Jesus took them uh, and he asked them to pray. So there are many accounts where Peter, James and John, you know, sort of they were they, they were being taken by Jesus here and there. The other disciples also. But this, uh, you know, this trio we read about them so james was killed 
Okay. Later on, we see another James. That's a different James who is the leader of the, the church. Uh, he's the half-brother of Jesus. But this James is the son of Zebedee, okay, son of Zebedee, who was murdered. Verse 3. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Verse 4. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So what happens is for political reasons. Now if we just uh, look at the persecution of uh, uh, Saul. Saul had a very different reason for persecution. You know, he was passionate about his faith and he thought that he was doing God's service as he was persecuting the people of the way. But what is Herod's reason for persecution? Herod is persecuting people for political points. And, you know, it's quite obvious. We are told he killed James and he saw that it pleased the Jews. So he understood the dynamics. He thought, wow, you know, if we uh, kill the leaders of the church, people are going to be so happy with me. So how about I do this to another leader? So he goes ahead and seizes Peter. But it was the festival time, okay, or or whatever, you know, the, the Jewish uh, uh, calendar is something very important for the Jews, uh, days of unleavened bread. So he thought, okay, how about I keep Peter in the prison and once this is over, uh, I will go ahead and kill Peter also. So how was Peter imprisoned? He was arrested and we are told four squads of soldiers kept him. If you recall earlier, we saw how God delivered the apostles from the prison and they went back, you know, to, to uh, uh, the temple area and they preached once again. So the authorities knew that these people are very strange, these church leaders. You know, though we, we imprison them, it is possible that they might escape. So four squads of leaders. So basically, there were four soldiers who, you know, through some chains or something like that, they were, they were uh, you know, connected to Peter. So you can imagine, you know, one uh, chain, one end of the chain on Peter's hand, and that is connected to the hand of a soldier. So like that, there were four soldiers who were connected to Peter. This is just to ensure that Peter does not escape so the idea was we'll safely keep peter in the prison and before uh, the people after passover we will murder uh, peter okay and uh, then there will be a greater support and the cheering of of the 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 people for the king herod agrippa one okay so that was the idea now, what happens? So this is, again, very beautiful how God works in the lives of uh, his people. So from verse 5 all the way uh, till verse uh, 19, you know, we read about the escape of Peter. So this incident, you know, this incident encourages us to note the power of prayer. So once Peter is in prison, we read in verse 5, constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So what is the church doing when their leader is uh, being persecuted? The leader is in the prison. The church is offering constant prayer. Sometimes we pray for our leader. Sometimes we pray for people who are being persecuted. And then we wonder, what can God do? you know, through our prayers. But you see what God does through the prayers of the church. So I think I'll quickly, you know, read through uh, this account or better still, one of you could please read from verse 6 to verse 19 and then I'll, I'll kind of summarize uh, what we have here. So Acts 12 verses 6 through 19. Pastor, can I read? Yes, go, go ahead. Uh, the night before Peter uh, was to be placed on trial, he was asleep fastened with two chains, 
between two uh, soldiers. Others stood up, stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought he, uh, it was a vision. He didn't realize that it was actually happening. They passed the first and the second guard post and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them, and this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from the Jewish leaders and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked uh, at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overwhelmed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. Uh, has it to do which verse? 19. Okay. 19. Okay, good. Okay. Verse 15. Uh, you're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the, uh, and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what happened to Peter. King, uh, sorry, Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him. When he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Afterward, Herod left Judea to stay in Caesarea for a while. Thank you, Kung. Thank you for reading that uh, long passage. But. Um, really encouraging uh, and very interesting isn't it that you know, we see that god supernaturally delivered peter now some ask the question why is it that james died uh, he was beheaded but peter escapes you know we don't know the answer to a question like that um the way i would look at it is i think it depends on the purpose of God for our lives. As far as persecution is concerned, you know, it's very hard to say why is it that some escape it and some others don't, like Stephen. You know, he was a man full of faith. He was a man who, uh, you know, performed signs, wonders, and miracles. So he was, he was an ideal disciple in the church. But why did Stephen die? Uh, we don't know. But you see, the, the life of the martyrs, you know, it's a seed for the church. So it's never a wasted thing. Um, and uh, we also saw how Jesus welcomed Stephen. Now, regarding James, we don't have anything written about how God welcomed him into, into glory. But one thing we know that definitely you know, Jesus would have uh, commended him and, uh, you know, appreciated him for what he went through. And as we study about the lives of all the, the disciples, you would see that except for John, who lived on to, to, uh, to a good old age, John the Apostle, all the others at some point or the other, you know, they, they were subject to this kind of uh, uh, violent martyrdom. Okay, uh, And uh, uh, we know, you know as, as, as believers, that uh, uh, this earth and this worldly life is not the end for us but we have a glorious life in christ even after uh, our our time here on earth so it's not a loss in eternity you know as paul writes to the believers and he says they are just asleep and you know they will come back uh, in glory as uh, jesus returns so uh, james was killed but Peter escapes. Okay, maybe it was just not the right time for Peter to, to die. So what happens? You know, there is a supernatural uh, 
um, you know, encounter with an angel. And Peter thinks that he's having a vision. Um, the angel, you know, there's a bright light, and then the angel starts instructing Peter and says, you know, arise quickly, put on your sandals, and it starts leading Peter. And, you know, first of all, we read that the chains fell off. Okay, so just think about the power of God. Here is Herod. He planned his best move. Four squads of soldiers. Make sure this church guy doesn't escape. But supernaturally, when the angel comes, you know, maybe that's an angel, you know, I don't know what uh, different kinds of angels we read in the Bible. This angel was engaged in Peter's deliverance. So the angel comes and the chains are broken. And, uh, you know, we read about iron gate and the gates, uh, you know, some gates and obstacles in the way. Nothing really holds Peter back. OK, so uh, that's a, that's again for us to understand the power of God. You know, we get anxious. Oh, what about this hindrance and what about that iron gate and, you know, um, different restrictions? God is able beyond even an iron gate to get us out. If, if he has intended to get us out, no gate can stop us. And that's what we see here. No chain can stop us. So Peter was freed supernaturally from those chains. He was brought out of those gates. And for all you know, you know, the man is still kind of sleepy and drowsy. And he's thinking he's it's a vision. It's only later that he realizes that these are all real things that are happening in his life. So even when he is not fully conscious, God is at work. And it just goes to tell us how powerfully God works and that he's a supernatural God. So he brings Peter out in this way. And Peter only realizes you know, when he's out and uh, you know he now has to find his way. And where would Peter go You know, after the angel disappears? He can only go to the fellowship of the believers. So he goes straight to the house of a Mary, the mother of uh, uh, John Mark. And there he finds, uh, you know, people were praying. They were praying. So how is it that God did this miracle in the life of Peter? Now, another thing we can say is that the church was praying. You know, when you have a praying church, Supernatural things take place. Supernatural deliverance takes place. So God sent an angel to deliver Peter as the people committed themselves to prayer. You see the power of prayer there? So the people were praying. And you know, Peter comes to that home. But look at the irony of it. You know, there's a girl, uh, uh, a girl called Rhoda. She comes to the to the gate, uh, to the door, she opens it and she's amazed to see Peter. He is out of the prison. But when she goes back and reports this to the believers, you know, it's funny that they say, oh, it can't be Peter, it's probably his angel. So in the Jewish tradition, they had this understanding that every human being has an angel. So, you know, it comes from the Jewish thought uh, that, oh, it's not Peter, it's his angel. Okay, now, there are some traditional thoughts and you know, some are scriptural. This is not a, a scriptural thought. Uh, so they just uh, assume that the angel of Peter looks like Peter standing at the door. But isn't it funny that here are the people who are praying for Peter's release? And Peter is released, but they are not able to accept it. You know, it's like that story where they say um, uh, a, a little girl prayed or a family of a little girl, they prayed that it would rain. And as they stepped out of the house, it was only the little girl who was carrying the umbrella because she believed that God would give rain, but the parents actually did not believe it. Okay, so something like that. So the people are finding it hard to accept that Peter is standing at the door. But what an amazing prayer answering God we have that the prayer was actually answered. and. You know, uh, the people, finally, they saw in verse 16, it says, Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were amazed uh, how God had answered it immediately. He didn't let Peter stay in the prison, uh, even through the entire night. Um, 
and there were 17, but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. So look at Peter. He is on assignment. Uh, yes, he rejoiced that he was delivered, but he is on his next duty now. And you don't read about Peter after this. Right? In the uh, book of Acts, uh, what happened to Peter? Luke will turn the story to focus on Paul Okay, from this point onwards. Because as I told you, it's likely that this entire book of Acts was more of a defense brief for Paul. So we, we read, though, you know, about the leadership of Peter so far and how he still continues to be on assignment and he's not afraid, uh, you know, to, to uh, do the work of the ministry. Of course, in the book of Galatians, we read there that, that, you know, Peter probably went and uh, Peter and Paul met and, uh, you know, Peter also wrote his epistles, first Peter, second Peter, uh, uh, after this. So that's about Peter and the miracle that God did in Peter's life. There is another incident that, uh, you know, people talk about in history, uh, about this individual called as uh, Sadhu Sundar Singh. Um, uh, he ministered in Tibet. He's a Tibetan Christian. And uh, it is said that he was thrown into a well. Okay, so that was the prison, thrown into a well, uh, and the well was closed. Okay. Uh, and the story and, and the incident goes something like uh, uh, he was in that well for three days there were many other bodies decaying bodies in the well and that was the form of punishment uh, that that was given to the accused so uh, after three days you know strangely uh, somebody opened you know the the covering of the well and uh, sadhu sundar singh was still alive at that point uh, and he noticed that the well is being opened and he uh, saw a rope coming down, a rescue rope, uh, which had a loop, which was comfortable enough for him to, uh, you know, position himself to be lifted out of the well. And it is also said that the loop, you no, know, it was helpful because he had uh, an injury in some part of his body. So he could comfortably keep that limb uh, on that loop and he was ready to be lifted out of the well so he was lifted out of the well and when he came out of the well apparently he found nobody outside okay so it was a very strange incident that he got rescued out of the well but there was nobody standing outside of the well and uh, uh, he went back to the same place where he was preaching earlier very similar to uh, the apostles so he goes back and he's preaching the next day morning the person uh, the, the authority who had imprisoned Sadhu Sundar Singh, he uh, asks the soldiers to bring him again. Okay, and uh, he starts inquiring, you know, whose carelessness is this that do you would let a prisoner out of the well? And a lot of questioning happens, and uh, you know they they start uh, they they question who had the keys to the well and all that, <coughs> and strangely, they find that the key which is supposed to open the well on the belt of that main guard himself you know the the person who's questioning he was the one who had the keys on his belt so there was no question of somebody else taking the key and letting uh, sadhu sundar singh out so mm, the incident whoever reported the incident stated this to show that God has his supernatural ways to rescue his people, to help them continue the work of the ministry. And you know, can we expect supernatural deliverance from God today? Um, very much so. God hasn't changed. His kingdom hasn't changed. Uh, you know, God still has ministering angels whom he can send to rescue people out of chains uh, through, you know, uh, mighty metal gates or whatever, whatever security is holding his people. God is able. And that's the way in which Peter was brought out because of the prayers, the constant prayers. That's a beautiful verse again. You know, if we just go back, verse 5, 
Acts 12, constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And through those prayers, the supernatural was made manifest in uh, Peter's life. And you know, Peter continues on his ministry. He went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now, a little bit more about Herod. So this Herod, uh, Agrippa won. He seems to be, you know, a hardcore politi politician. Uh, he wants power and he wants fame and he wants the applause of people. So verses 20 uh, through 24, you know, uh, we read how uh, some cities like Tyre and Sidon, okay, Tyre and Sidon, um, Herod had been very angry with them, but Tyre and, the people of Tyre and Sidon want to appease Herod. Okay, so uh, they they kind of make a deal with him, and uh, you know they they want him to visit their city. So for some sort of a peace treaty is happening between Herod and Tyre and Sidon. So uh, they invite uh, Herod to come and visit. So. Also, we understand from these scriptures that they wanted food supply from Herod. Okay? So at that point, maybe they did not have food and they wanted food. So Herod goes to visit the people of Tyre and Sidon. In verse 21, it says, So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. So seems like a very you know, self-indulgent uh, proud, self-reliant uh, individual here, Herod, he is very well dressed and you know, he's just all flashy. He goes to the people and he makes a speech. So what happens after that? Verse 22, and the people kept shouting the voice of a God and not of a man. You know, the people are enabling his his self-dependence and his pride. And they're saying, oh, wow, uh, whatever Herod is saying, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. Okay, So we see the pride of an individual here. Verse 23 says that immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. Okay, So strange, you know, like a judgment comes upon Herod in that very moment. Where have we seen this kind of judgment happen? We've seen it in Acts 5 in the church. But here is judgment coming upon a leader, a very powerful leader, because of his pride and not giving glory to God. Another angel. So angels have different roles, maybe some warrior angel or something, immediately struck by an angel. And you know, we read about him being eaten by worms and dying. So that's the uh, very painful death of a proud ruler uh, who thought you know, who thought he could get the applause of people, he could get the support of people, and uh, if that was all that was required but you know there is a god isn't it there is a god above all of these things and uh, god did not uh, god was not pleased with his life and because he did not give glory to god there was judgment on herod and he dies verse 24 says but the word of god grew and multiplied so i don't know if you have noticed you know after every uh, incident in different cities we see how the church grew, the hand of the Lord was upon the church, the, the God's grace was upon the church, many were added to the church, the word of God grew and multiplied. So you see, nothing, even persecution at its height, where a notable leader of the church was killed. Imagine you know, what would happen uh, today in our context, if a notable person was killed uh, or persecution came upon the leadership, people would be so discouraged and we would imagine that that is the end of the ministry or that is the end of God's work. But time and again in the book of Acts, no matter what we see, the word of God grew and multiplied. God's word, God's work is never contained. Nothing is a good enough strategy to stop what God is doing here on the earth. 
So it's again so uplifting and encouraging to note that even at a time of intense persecution, the word of God grew and multiplied, meaning people were hearing about Jesus, people were giving their lives to Jesus, you know, people were being equipped in the word, many disciples were being formed, leaders were being raised up. All this is going on parallelly as you, know, you see persecution, you know, unfolding upon the people. Now, verse 25, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So you see team ministry there and accountability. They were given a task, they completed the task, they went to Jerusalem to provide relief and we see that task is completed. Okay, so the work, the ministry is going on despite persecution. So uh, Barnabas and Saul finish their task, they come back and there is another person added to the team. Who is this? His name is John Mark. Remember Rhoda, uh, uh, you know, she was in the house of those believers praying when Peter was rescued. The house of Mary, whose son is John Mark. So that is who John Mark is. We will read a little bit more about John Mark later on. So let me just stop here. We will start with Acts chapter 13 uh, in the next class. Any thoughts, any comments before we pray and close for today? Okay, I think uh, a lot happening uh, in these passages. So uh, do think about it. And if you have something to share, you can uh, post that on the stream page or you know, share uh, in our next class. Uh, from Acts 13, it's more of an intentional, uh, you know, intentional ministry or intentional missions uh, that will get started. And we will focus more on the life of Apostle Paul. So I want to request somebody to please pray as we close today's class. Okay, any volunteer? Kishri Kumar, would you please? Shall I pray, ma'am? Yes, yes, sister. Please go ahead. Father, we thank you. We bless your holy name as we stand in honor of your all of your early works in the church, Lord God. We thank and praise you. The way we, we could see the hand of God working in disciples' life magnifying your name in the earth and spreading your gospel, Lord. We thank and praise you. Enable us to be your faithful, committed, and passionate disciples, Lord God, wherever we are. Thank you for our teacher, Nancy, Pastor. Bless her as a group, Lord. Bind us together with more of your love and fill us, Father. To In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, and we will meet again uh, next Friday. Bye for now. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.